Thank you all. That was lovely. And Thundercloud of the Ho-Chuck Nation has said, the concept of setting aside just one day for giving thanks doesn't fit. We, the Ho-Chuck Nation, think of every day as Thanksgiving. There is a beautiful lesson in this message that we too can give thanks every single day. And as we move into this time of prayer, May we remember that the calling out to God in our most familiar prayer may also be seen as an invocation that can only become manifest in our lives when we put our lives into the service of making peace. If you will say with me now the Lord's Prayer from the New Zealand Prayer Book. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and shall be, Father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echoes through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the earth. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. From trials too great to bear, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Spirit of life, come unto me. Sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion. Oh, in the wind, rise in the sea, move in thy hand, giving life the shape of justice. Roots hold me close, wings set me free. Spirit of life, come to me, come to me. Thank you, Deb. And now we welcome Carolyn Rosen with a stewardship moment because it is still November for a couple more days. And so still our stewardship month for the North, for the North Bay that we care so much about. Carolyn Rosen, thank you for being here. I love to hear about the spiritual journeys of previous speakers. When thinking about how I found North Bray, I think it was the right time, right place. I grew up going to a small country Methodist church in Arkansas. The members felt like family. In fact, about a fourth of the members were my relatives. 
We had potlucks and a Christmas Eve program, just as North Bray has done. On Christmas Eve, the children had their play and the youngest child always got to recite, I'm not very big and I'm not very tall, but I can say Merry Christmas to you all. I still remember reciting those words. When I attended college in another state, I found another Methodist church. After college, my journey continued to multiple cities and states as I continued my career. I was an Episcopalian, a Lutheran, a Methodist a couple of times, and then I met my Jewish husband. The numerous churches I had attended never had that family feeling that I had when I was young. About 30 years ago, my husband Jim and I attended a wedding at North Bray. We were impressed by the beauty of our sanctuary with the stained glass and the small garden behind the altar. We lived a 10 minute walk from the church. When Jim became ill and was hospitalized frequently, I needed a place to go for comfort and peace. I came to Sunday services a couple of Sundays in the years that Jim was hospitalized. In 1996, when Jim passed, I was lost. I didn't know what to do or where to go. I walked into the office and asked Diane about having Jim's memorial at North Bray and could Dave Sugarbaker Baker officiate. Both Diane and Dave made me feel like I had the strength to get through this terrible time. They were supportive and actually led me through the planning of the memorial. We put the menorah on the altar and planned the service. I will never forget Jim's brother asking me how I found a church, not synagogue, that had a menorah and the Star of David on the altar. The family was pleased with the service and appreciative that I had acknowledged their faith. After the memorial, I started attending Sunday services. Within a few weeks, Dave started a grief group. Marion Martin, Judy Roberts, and Suzanne Strobe were a part of that group. For the first time since leaving my country church, I felt like I was joining a church family. The feeling has never left me. North Bray has many activities that enhance the family feeling. Pictures of my family at Thanksgiving and Mother's Day luncheons hang on refrigerator doors or framed as at my house, thanks to John Penberthy. My grandson, Danny, loved to run the dishwasher after the meals. And my granddaughter, Julie, loves to babysit on Sunday mornings. She told me a couple of weeks ago, Grandma, I sure miss our Sundays together. When I think of our wonderful church family, I realize what a blessing it is for me and others. The thought of losing this community and family, as Suzanne mentioned, happened to her previous church, would be heartbreaking. So let's think about what we can give this year to maintain this very unique and special church. We never know when someone will walk through our doors looking for a church family. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. That touched my heart deeply. We're so glad you're part of this community. Me too. <laughs> I've got a special thing now uh, for everyone and it's gonna take me a little while because it's a video and I'm just going to, as you see, I'm sharing my screen already. Okay. Look at that. Here we go. Uh, thanks to John Penberthy. Thank you. 
Well, that was fun and wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if you caught that, but John Pemberthy uh, recorded that for us. Thank you. It was good to be back in the chapel a wee bit. Thank you, Deb. That was lovely. And now Elizabeth will Elizabeth Hutchins will read the scripture readings for this morning. We have two scripture readings from her this morning. The first is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. They came to Jericho. And as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind men saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Our second reading is from Thich Nhat Hanh, walking for our ancestors and future generations. All our ancestors and all future generations are present in us all the time. Happiness is not an individual matter. As long as the ancestors in us are still suffering, we can't be happy and we will transmit that suffering to our children and their children. When we walk, we can walk for our ancestors and future generations. Maybe they had to walk with their sorrow. Perhaps they were forced to march or migrate. When we walk freely, we are walking for them. If we take one step freely and happily, touching the earth mindfully, then we can take 100 steps like that. We do it for ourselves and for all previous and future generations. We all arrive at the same time and find peace and happiness together. Thank you, Elizabeth. The sermon this morning is called So Many Thousandth Noels. Every Sunday service we put together here at Northbray is the work of many hands. Scriptures written long ago in faith still guide us. Deb with her music blesses each of us. Jacqueline's voice raises up. All of the worship's assistants and sacred, so sacred storytellers, whether they know it or not, are part of creating a, a, 
a spiritual environment that is an open and inclusive, that pays attention to and honors this congregation, past, present, and future. Many have found their voice here. I am sure of this because I am one. Kathy and Elizabeth and each of our guest preachers add their insights and words of inspiration. Not all of the inspiration comes from putting together the service itself. You know, at North Ray, we don't often uh, follow the electionary or have mandatory prayers to speak. But it is the fruit from a seed planted in the week just past or in the year from which our conversations as friends and community arise. This service, more perhaps than many others, is a gift from many people. Even before I knew that Greg Ledbetter would be called into grief this week, I had a hunch that this Sunday would be different from what we planned. Maybe it's just fitting for the first Sunday of Advent in this strange, difficult, revealing year things would not flow exactly how we had scheduled them in the early drafts of the bulletin. We must bow to the, the demands of our lives, though that may not always be the teachings you hear when you greet organized religions, it is a teaching in every religion. Think of the stories that we tell, the Buddhist monk who looks past his vow of celibacy and carries a woman across the raging stream, a nursing mother an elderly man, or even a traveler may be allowed to eat during the daylight hours of Ramadan because of their needs. Jesus healed on the Sabbath day, forgoing the rest that is called for in the commandments because someone else's need was greater. It is a teaching to honor as great as any in the Torah, and it is in the Torah, to take care of one another when the need is there. And this may be among the greatest lessons we have learned in our coronavirus pandemic. Yes, I call it our pandemic because we are the ones who hurt and we are the ones who heal. It is ours and it is holy to yield to the needs of the day. It's a difficult time right now. We have had to celebrate what is, so, is to so many people their favorite holiday of Thanksgiving giving thanks apart from one another or with only a few loved ones who are living in the same household. A bountiful meal for two seems meager when we think of last year's extravagant buffet, but we, we were with extended family and friends. I think of the laughter coming from the kids' table that drifts towards the grown-ups and makes even grumpy old purd smile, yes, I did have an uncle named Purd. This year, so many of us swallowed longing with our bird and stuffing. Far too many of us felt such longing without the luxury of a home cooked meal. I have heard it said that a pandemic shows its people its own face. What face do our people wear? What do we see in this strange year? And who indeed are we? Today, we take the first step of Advent, which in this year must, we must celebrate with even more social distance because the virus is spreading and the real fear as the number of coronavirus cases rise across the country and at home creep ever closer to those we love. The progressions of Sunday in Advent name our feelings, faith, hope, joy, and love. But is that really what we're feeling right now? In Advent, our feelings are sung out over and over again, and it feels good to sing of hope. But how do we manage the exuberance that the season calls for in a year like this? How do we celebrate a birth when human fear surrounds us? In the liturgical year, Advent is the phase of time in which we are preparing ourselves for the birth of Jesus. Most of my life, I have seen it as a month of celebration, of anticipation for the big day. Among the Christian Christmas decorations I grew up with was a creche, and I would not be surprised if a majority of us here can picture in their minds an Advent creche of their childhood. It was up to my sister and me to set up the creche, and every year the positions were the same. 
Jesus in the manger, Mary and Joseph beside him, a couple of shepherds and a couple of sheep, a cow, three wise men with dark complexions, and an angel wearing a banner that said Gloria hovered on a tiny nail at the pinnacle of the A-frame barn. My grandmother told me not to put the baby Jesus in the manger until Christmas, but rarely did I listen to her in that regard. I suppose it is premature to have a baby in the manger on this day, so uh, almost a month away from Christmas day, but isn't the birth we await, the baby's birth, isn't the crush simply a symbol to bind us to that story? Every year when we hear the story, we already know the ending. Jesus will be laying in the manger once again, and Jesus will live out his singular life. Delivering to the, the baby to the manger is not the end of the story at all. For most of human history, when a woman became pregnant, she knew that there was a good chance that either she or her unborn child would not live through the experience of birth. In the time that Jesus lived, there were other hazards everywhere. Falls, cuts that went septic, childhood diseases, and those diseases that pained the aged, and Caesar's ever-present army. Death was a deeper shade of life, an intimate companion, always with you. Can we feel it? Can we feel it in this liminal state of Advent? What does it do to our perceptions of our lives here, our lives here? This part of the story was not taught to me growing up. I grew up with vaccines and penicillin. I grew up assuming that almost every time you got sick, you got better. We still have vaccines and penicillin Despite our fears, it is the case that almost any time we get sick, we will get better. Death sits farther off from us these days, or seems to. And we modern mortals prefer to ignore the face of death for as long as we can. Yet death is as much a part of Advent as birth is. Perhaps in the hush of, rush of celebration, we can't lose ourselves to merriment but Christmas is a celebration of the mortal birth of a mortal man. For most Christians, the day welcomes the birth of the Son of God. He is miraculously incarnate as a human, born to heal and teach us, fellow humans. But for everyone to be born may, is to make a pact with dying. We are mortal a word with its roots in death. In most of Christianity, there are two big days, Christmas and Easter, the human birth of Jesus and the human death and spiritual appearance of him at the end of his life. In our Western American culture, Christmas is the big celebration, but for much of the Christian world, Easter is the most holy of days. Even with the carols and the lights on our trees this Christmas time, even with the joy of birth, we know that Jesus's life end and must end for his message of faith, hope, joy, and love to reach us. We celebrate that birth, even knowing that life ends. We celebrate the union of our mortal world, world with the everlasting spark of the divine, and that never dies. For the first of today's readings, I chose a story with the th from within the thriving life of Jesus, one that is about his work in the world. It is a short passage from the Gospel of Mark, the healing of Bartimaeus. In this section of the Gospel, not to mention in this section of a life of Jesus, healing of Bartimaeus is really just one of many healings he performs. Yet its brevity here is filled to the brim with meaning. And a good many sermons are written on these seven verses. But there are three things I wanna focus on and bring into sharper detail today. The cloak, the conversation, and the continuation. The old blind beggar is covered in a cloak, a darkness that is as much a symbol as it is a garment. 
when Jesus hears him and sends his people to bring him forward, Bartimaeus throws off his cloak. Such a dramatic flourish. What does it mean? Let's say the cloak is the story's objective correlative. You may remember from high school literature class, the objective correlative is something, usually an object, but not always. It's something in a story that carries an extraordinary amount of meaning. If Bartimaeus throws off his cloak, he throws off his old life, his darkness, his blindness, his fear of mort mortality, his ability to hide, even from himself. The conversation between Bartimaeus and Jesus is fairly simple, if you don't count the ruckus that must have been going on around them. And it follows a pattern that occurs in almost every one of Jesus's healings. He asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus is direct, my teacher, let me see again. To which Jesus credits not himself, but Bartimaeus's faith for his healing. Your faith has made you well, Jesus tells him. Then with Bartimaeus well again, the whole party continues on and Bartimaeus goes too. They are on the way. Today, the verse Sunday of Advent, our focus is on faith. What would it take for us in this season of growing cold to throw off our cloaks? How might we walk along the way as well. Thich Nhat Hanh gives us a practice of subtle walking, of measured and treasured steps. It is a practice that seems to me appropriate for this era in our history and this shortened span of festivities. Many of us have found solace during the pandemic, walking outside, walking around, walking in Tilden, walking by the beach, walking down by the marina. And even those who cannot walk for miles can walk in their imaginations. We can imagine the link that we have to those mortal ancestors and progeny who are only now just stories, but stories that once lived and stories that will live and stories that shape us anyway are part of us and we are part of them. We can imagine walking with our ancestors, with our progeny, we are together. Thich Nhat Hanh gives us the gift of healing. Our actions, our mindful, loving imaginations can heal the wounds of those who gave us the gift of life. Our walking and imagining them now, a people yet to come, is prayer. A prayer in the dark of the year, a prayer in this dark year. Our walking, let it be a part of our thanksgiving. Let it be that we too are on the way that Jesus taught, that Buddha taught, that all spiritual leaders teach, the way of healing in the world. It is in the infinite middle when we have our chance to live, hope, and heal. The middle of our lives between our birth and death. Let our faith in the living heart of the divine be the way we welcome every birth, every day, let it be the prayerful way that we walk, the way that we give to others. Let it be the way we welcome hardship as well as merriment. Let it be the way we face even death, knowing that life is full and, is, and divine shines through. Amen. And now if you will join with us all together to sing the first Noel. Noel, a word that comes from the root of being born. Me. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Deb. Thank you all for singing that first Christmas carol of the year. Mm -hmm. I am so grateful to be in this company of people, this company of spirits and hearts and loving kindness. Let us go out and live our lives fully. Let us get messy in the stuff of love. Let us get messy in the stuff of healing and let us get messy in the stuff of hope and faith joy and love. These are the things that make our lives so beautiful. All that messy muck of love. Let us go out now and be human. Even as the days grow shorter, they will soon grow long. Amen. Say my peace I leave with you. Amen. amen.